the economic crisis of capitalism is real. That became evident in 2008. Some of us knew it was already beginning. They haven't really recovered. Uh, certain countries have done well <coughs> in spite of it. Um, secondly, in spite of the fantasies of the ruling groups in Washington, D.C., climate change is real. It's going to play increasing degrees of damage to agriculture, to economics in general, and to human beings. I mean, in my private conversations with some environmentalists, we're talking about how many extra tens of millions of peat deaths are we counting with each year we delay in getting serious about changing the emissions. Uh, that's going to generate refugees that make the current huge refugee numbers look pathetic. Given the nature of capitalist states, it's probably going to generate more wars. Hopefully non-nuclear. If it's nuclear, we don't have to worry anymore. Uh, but given that, that's, think what that's going to mean for money and for programs that run on the basis of volunteers. All those volunteers are going to be going into hurricane relief, drought relief, helping the refugees and stuff like that. We can't compete, at least not until not until the plagues get back on a massive level. Um, all of that is going to affect, obviously, the budgets and the policies of things like the Global Fund, or UNAIDS, you name it. Um, they're going to affect the country's politics in different ways. We have seen a polarization occurring in a lot of countries in recent years. A lot, of the, a lot of the richer countries we've seen some polarization. We have seen the main politics of elections being between the neoliberal center, which has brought us all these problems, and the semi-fascist or fascist right. The left is trying to get itself organized. In the United States, where I'm from, I think we have a sheer serious chance to organize a serious real left in the next five years. Um, some other countries, I know less about. Uh, but those are likely to be the political situations we're in. And that, one of the reasons I say we need a real left and a harm reduction movement that's organized is to help us think through and organize for that kind of a situation. We also need people who are not left in the harm reduction movement being organized. I mean, <coughs> internationally the successes of harm reduction have been partly because we've said we're scientific, we're neutral, yada, yada, yada. we're just trying to reduce harm. I mean, we've all known that on a certain level that's BS, but on a certain other level it's real because there is the technocratic wing of harm reduction that has been very well done by many public health departments. And like in the state of New York has really, with the help of a lot of people like me, you guys, has really brought the AIDS and HIV epidemic way down. I mean, people are talking about 30 injectors in New York City a year now being infected, when it used to be in the thousands. Uh, so that's the situation we're going to be facing. And the kinds of questions I want us to discuss, in addition to the fact that some people may think I'm simply full of it when I say that, and wrong, and that's a legitimate topic for discussion, is in that circumstance, how do we keep ourselves from biting each other in the throat 
And you know, I know we're going to fight over money. You know, the different programs. That, that, but how do we? In addition to that, some people are going to say the way to do it is to make nice with government. And they're not necessarily wrong. That, if that gets resources, that's good for the short run. At the other hand, others of us are going to say, yes, but we also have to work with the insurgencies. And I, in this space this morning, I pointed out to people who are organizing the AIDS conference for next year, the incredible guilt the AIDS movement should carry for what happened in South Africa. We all knew that the African National Congress and the freedom movement in South Africa was going to come to power for several years before it did. Why the hell weren't we doing a really good job of helping train those activists in the public health crisis that was going to hit them? Partly it's because we didn't know enough. I mean, partly it's, I didn't. <laughs> but if we repeat that, you know, that's negligence. And so we've got to relate to them, even on the level of just education, but to do that with some, many of the movements, left and right, who may come to power. We've got to have people who can talk to them in their own language. There's one thing harm reductionists know, it's the importance of speak, being able to speak to people in their own language. So, and the other question we have to learn, and drug users have a lot of knowledge of this already, but the rest of us are woefully ignorant, is in circumstances of political repression, including of harm reduction, how do we operate? How do we keep secret? How do we do the syringe exchanges, the naloxone underground transportations and things? How do we do that in circumstances where the government is actively opposed and may even be setting up in concentration camps for their political enemies or shooting us? You know, this, this is the reality we may face depending how bad it gets in the particular place you are. Um, and the other question, which goes to the question I asked at the plenary this morning, if people heard it, is who are our allies and how do we relate to them? Because when, you know, I'm talking big politics as, as well as harm reduction politics. Simultaneously, we've got to consider this. When the country like the United States is potentially polarizing between the fascist and the serious left, how do we make sure the serious left wins? How, and, and you know, say it does. Say we've got you know, Black Lives Matter and labor movements and things bursting out and going for power seriously. How do we get them to care about us? Drug users, throw them under the bus. It, it makes it more likely you're going to win. I mean, that's got to be their calculus in that situation. On the other hand, we have skills and community roots and reality of certain kind on our side. And how are we going to do that? So those are the questions I think we should discuss. We don't have a lot of time. I talked too long. How much time do we have? Time ten, keep ten minutes. Ten minutes is all? No, even by my watch, we've got more than 11 minutes. Okay. In any case, people can comment. I'm going to sit for a minute because I'm tired. And just remember to speak up when you <coughs> speak. Yes, Matt. Yes. Uh, <coughs> Sam, as you know, from the UK, when you came to spoke to us about your. One of our family meetings on where we call it scapegoats or uh, drug users, scapegoats or activists. And it was a very powerful framing for us to go on and, uh, and try to organise together. And I'm just, um, as 
the left wing activist and the drug user activist, I'm always struck by the social conservatism, social conservatism of the left. And uh, I just wonder how you how you feel to overcome that sort of strategy of trying to bring more socially liberal issues into the left, which. Yeah, I, I, every time I try to raise things like that in some left wing groups, there's often quite a tendency to suppress it and ask them not to stir up trouble among the old leaders because they didn't understand these new issues. And I wonder what your thoughts were. Partly that was the British left. <laughs> I mean, seriously, because the British left at that time was socially conservative and to some extent still is, as we saw in the recent case of how you deal with rape cases in, or sexual harassment cases in the British Socialist Workers Party. Um, the, in the United States, one of the heartening signs is that the Black Lives Matter movement is being led by out lesbians, trans, and things of color. So that, and it's not getting, they're, they're not getting much kickback on that. Um, <coughs> some of the labor unions, you know, but you see, we're not, I don't think that in the United States you're ever going to see the labor leadership doing anything much useful. They'll, they'll give you some money sometimes. It's the labor activists that are the question. Now some of them are socially conservative, but some of them aren't. And you know, the, the youth culture of my generation has infected a lot of the people who are now the labor activists. I mean, China? I don't know. You know, if there's anyone here who really understands the Chinese situation on that, that would be useful input. <coughs> India, same thing. You know, part of what's going on here is a fight between the social conservative pro-capitalist fascists and, se and semi-fascists and people who want to reduce harm of various kinds. Uh, my name is Andy Velez. I'm a founding member of ACTA. And um, one of the first things we learned was that good taste was way too expensive. And you had to dump that and forget about it and not worry about being liked. Uh, that it was more important to put out the truth People were dying, and we needed to do whatever we could to stop that. And uh, uh, the, the left has never been friendly to gays. Uh, it was uh, uh, Bayard Rustin was a, a leader in the uh, civil rights movement. He was gay. He was shunned because of it and not given his proper place. So we have to simply tell the truth the best we can and keep pushing forward. As one of my sons says, Dad, I'm just putting one foot in front of the other. And that's what we have to do. And not take crap from anybody. Here, here. Agreed. Although the history of the left and the gays has been much more complicated than that. I mean, you know, I was recently reading Peter Drucker. And, you know, I remember when I lived in Los Angeles. And in roughly 1969 and 1970, the Pink Tide magazine came out of revolutionary, socialist, left, gay, liberationist, with real roots in the gay community. And some of the left groups I knew of and around had some real trouble with that. I'm proud to say that the one I was working with didn't. And you know, we had joint members and stuff. Um, the history is very complicated, very localized. You know, one of the lessons we've learned in harm reduction is you have to take the local history and experience and situation and build on it. And where that local history is the kind of socially conservative, reactionary in some ways anti-gay, anti-whatever left you're talking about, we have to face that. And where it's not, we have to face it. One of the examples I was recently talking to somebody about was South Africa. 
for reasons having nothing to do with this, but remember that in South Africa in 1922, the Communist Party of South Africa, which was still revolutionary in those days, had a massive mind strike with the slogan, let's see if I can remember it, uh, unite and fight for a white South Africa. I mean, the history of the left has some very ugly spots in it, and some very inspiring and beautiful. And the history of any of the social <laughs> movements we want to talk about, the gay movement, the black movement, the, even the AIDS movement, at various times have done some things that we're not proud of also. And the job is to form the unity and fight. Yes, um, <coughs> the question I have on this show I have is twofold. No. I, I come from, I, I've been working in HIV for decades, and there has been a sense of being apolitical. I've been, you know, I've been working in Myanmar, for example. We, my institute's working now for 25 years. We went through the whole military junta, and, and there's been a lot of fantastic harm reduction work in Myanmar. And I wonder what some of my colleagues around these, 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 these very impoverished, complex political functions like Myanmar, like China, we work in Tibet, I give you lots of examples. What they would, how they would respond to this, this motion. And I'm an I'm a, usually a member of the international Marxist group, um, but that's got nothing to do with it at all. My question is, is it about setting up kind of faction that in harm reduction perceive themselves as anarchist, leftist, socialist? Or is it about taking harm reduction in a different direction with these underlying principles? And today for the first time in, in many harm reduction conferences I've been to, where there has been a kind of socio-political agenda or discussion or debate, which I think is very interesting and encouraging, because for once it's something different going on. Talk about the same stuff. So my maybe question for everybody is: Is it about creating a faction? Is it about creating alliances with left-wing factions outside, left-wing groups outside that movement, or is it just about creating a new way of thinking about where we go forward? I'm going to let other people speak yeah, to that in a moment. I'm very worried about the fact that unless I'm forgetting somebody, only men have spoken. Only white men. Uh, but quick answer to that in terms of my position. If people try to take over the international harm reduction movement, that would be a major mistake. Where to create activities that are not hostile to it, but where we can work together and do what needs to be done in parallel or together. I mean, you know. Rick Lines is not my enemy, you know. But I want to hear other people, particularly people who aren't, you know, I am white males. Okay.
like almost universally around the world, and we're constantly reactive and trying to fight and try to gain some breadcrumbs from the state. And we spend most of our time doing that in reactive positions, trying to fight whether it's for human rights or for a supervised injection service. But then we get you know marred down and all the other stuff. And I think that's where people on the left, where we've been, where we have been pummeled. Like we have been like no matter where you live, and then you know like you got excited about the French election between whether we're have fascist or neoliberal banker, and people are excited and neoliberal banker wins, and that made me want to cry because I thought, where is the alternative? Where do we have that? And that's the same in harm reduction when we when we rotate uh, the same kind of. We'll just take what we can get, and we just like hope for the best. <laughs> and, and you know, the, when I asked that question at the plenary this morning, of saying, "How do we get them to ally with us?" And oh, you know, you could see the panel saying, "What a new question!" Deborah had thought of it a little bit. You know, answered it well from her perspective. You know, there has been an organized, a semi quasi organized left current within harm reduction for at least 20 years. And we've been frustrated every step of the way because those kinds of questions don't get asked and don't get answered and don't get acted on. And we see opportunities being frittered away because no one's talking about it. And beyond that, I'm sure there were other opportunities we just didn't see because we weren't organized to talk to each other. So that, you know, this is not a sectarian maneuver that we're doing. I mean, Zoe and I have major political disagreements. You know, this is a case of trying just to make it a situation where we can do some additional harm reduction of kinds and building some support for it in places where we think we're going to need it within the next five years. Because you know, your question, which goes both ways, you know, is a real one. And it's time for me to quit so that my friend can take over. And I'm going to We're going to pick it up from here, so... This is good.